Your Majesty. Your Majesty, Excellencies, uh, previous laureates, ladies and gentlemen. That's a very hard act to follow uh, in terms of the scene setting. And uh, whilst I agree wholeheartedly with the, all the issues that uh, Johan sort of highlighted there, I'm going to focus in this next few minutes on looking at how we can intensify agriculture as in the best sustainable ma manner possible. Uh, there are still a number of issues to deal with here, and uh, it's a very difficult task. I think it's clear from the evidence that we can produce enough food for, for 9 billion people on the planet. But the key question is whether, as Johan has explained, is can we do that uh, and can the planet cope in terms of uh, its ecosystem services and its natural resilience? Feeding more people, however, is not just a simple, not just a, an issue of uh, biophysical sciences uh, and technology. It really is an issue of uh, looking at some of the social and governance issues, which are so critical if we want to sort of deal with these uh, these important issues. And so, what I want to do in this short talk is focus a little bit on how can we scale up what look to be some of the most sustainable options for intensifying agriculture. And at the same time, uh, one of the tasks for researchers is as we put these measures into practice, is actually to look and determine whether or not the ecosystems, which are so vital in terms of the services, are resilient, are being maintained, and making sure we're not continuing down that uh, steep slope uh, towards oblivion or whatever awaits us if we don't get this right. And I want to do this by running through uh, three, if you like, success stories from the International Water Management Institute and a wide number of partners. And these all involve uh, both science and a strong input of policy and, and governance. They, are, they come from India and from Gujarat, uh, the Jyoti Gram Scheme, which means uh, lighted village. Uh, a developing uh, story from Tanzania in Africa, and uh, another story uh, again developing as we speak from West Bengal. I'll start with the Jyoti Gram Scheme in Gujarat, India. The critical issue in uh, northwestern uh, India has been over exploitation of groundwater. And in fact, I think last year or the year before, NASA demonstrated from gravity maps that they could see uh, how much water had actually been extracted. It's a very, very significant amount uh, which was being picked up from satellite information. And one of the main reasons why there has been so much over extraction there is not because agriculture desperately needs all that water. It's because there has been provision by governments of subsidised electricity. And it's easier for farmers to leave the pumps running than perhaps go out and turn them off. So we've been using vastly too much uh, electricity and, and too much water in that area. People thought long and hard about what was the solution to this. Uh, it's very difficult to get Indian farmers to accept metres. Uh, it's very difficult to stop them tampering with electricity supply lines. And so the, uh, the rather perverse solution, which uh, you wouldn't think of first, was actually to duplicate the electricity supply system to many of these villages which uh, used a lot of electricity for pumping. So the electricity authorities were persuaded to duplicate the system. So we have one system going to the homes, which could run as best possible 24 hours a day, and another system going to the pumps. And once that was in place, all the government had to do was actually turn off the power to the system going to the pumps for whatever period of the day they thought was appropriate. And generally that was something like uh, 16 hours a day, allowing eight hours of access to electricity to pump the water. This had an amazing outcome. In Gujarat alone, this cost about uh, 300 plus million US dollars to implement, and it was a trial sort of scheme. Uh, there are no actual figures, I'm told, yet about the real savings, but uh, there's anecdotal evidence 
that uh, there have been phenomenal savings in subsidised electricity, not surprisingly if you're only providing a third to these pumps, which are pretty thirsty beasts. Uh, and not only that, groundwater use was significantly reduced and groundwater tables started to stabilise. And the corollary was that on the positive side, there was no decline in agricultural yield in most areas. And a, and a collateral benefit was that uh, the villages had a more stable power supply. This has been a remarkable, successful story. It came from a, a combination of people. Uh, Tushar Shah and Imi uh, set up some of these suggestions, but uh, the Chief Minister of Gujarat was very instrumental in sort of making sure that this was uh, put in place and rolled out. And since this happened, uh, several years ago now, the Punjab has followed in the same process. Uh, Rajasthan is going that way, and virtually every Indian state has a plan to do something similar. So we have a tremendous outreach here of something which uh, clearly maintains or sustains agricultural production, but also has a benefit for the uh, environment. Not only in the less use of electricity, but just think of the carbon uh, saving in terms of generation costs. So that was the first story. The second one is a, a story, a work in progress from uh, Tanzania. Uh, we've been working with uh, Gates Foundation funding with the FAO, um, Stockholm Environment Institute, uh, and a range of local partners uh, to look uh, at IDE, an American um, NGO, looking at uh, what approaches are potentially available for agricultural water management in different environments. Every country, every region is different. Some have groundwater resources, some have better soil resources, some have surface water resources that can be, uh, can be developed. But it's never the same in any one place. And uh, we have worked through some of the possibilities for better agricultural water management in Tanzania with full compliance of Tanzanian officials and governments. And you can see one of the early outcomes here is the government has put a, a modest amount of money into its additional amount of money into its budget to sort of help roll this program out in the future. And what we've done, I don't, you, you can't see all the details here, but uh, uh, what this illustrates is that we've looked at areas where we could introduce low cost motorised pumps. Uh, in the country. Some areas you can and some areas you can't. So there's a suitability uh, a mapping there uh, which looks at where is this biophysically possible. We've also looked at in situ water, rainwater harvesting and I think we've looked at uh, river pumping as well. And having defined where these places can go, we then start, where these things can be done, we then started to look at uh, what are the incentives, need, incentives needed to get them rolling out? Sometimes it's strong links with the private sector to make sure we have appropriate supply chains. Sometimes it's a need for microfinance. And again, there's never one solution that fits everywhere. We've done this in five other African countries. And I think the thing I really want, the take-home message from this slide, is uh, look at the numbers of farmers that can benefit appropriately from these kind of technologies. This is uh, another one. This is pumping from river diversions. Again, half a million people could be beneficially affected. And we believe that if we follow these plans and we match the sustainability issues with the uh, appropriate incentives from government and the private sector and the finance industry, we can make a very, very big difference. And this is in one country. This has been replicated in another four in Africa and in two states in India. So great potential, but making sure we use the scientific information to develop appropriately. This is a, a final case uh, from West Bengal, and it's, this is a really interesting story. India has benefited tremendously from the tremendous development in the northwestern states, but at the same time, we've seen these problems with overdraft of groundwater in the northwestern states. In the northeastern states, in the lower down, lower down the Ganges system, there hasn't been anything like the same degree of development of, uh, of agriculture. Certainly, there are wet season there are wet season crops, and the area is quite productive. But there are there is potential in many of the eastern states to really double production by going into dry more dry season cropping 
Um, and, and also using groundwater where there's plenty of groundwater. In many of these areas, the groundwater is regularly recharged by a very consistent monsoon. It's often very close to the surface, so there are not very high pumping costs. There is one major caveat, and that is quite a lot of the groundwater in uh, some of these eastern states has significant proportions of arsenic. And we heard a very good talk yesterday about the potential not only for arsenic getting into drinking water, which we know about and is causing a major problem in um, Bangladesh and in, and in eastern India, but also for being taken up in uh, some of the rice varieties preferred by local farmers. So what we've done in this area, and, and I should have mentioned that West Bengal is a state which is uh, self-sufficient in energy at the moment, uh, so there is plenty of electricity. We've looked very carefully at uh, those areas where there is ar arsenic and those areas where there isn't arsenic in the groundwater and defined suitability maps to intensify agriculture from the use of shallow groundwater. However, there are two, or there were, two major disincentives for people to adopt uh, more groundwater pumping. One was that for even small farmers pumping enough water to irrigate half a hectare or a hectare, there was a very high license fee to get access to groundwater. And this was uh, made even harder because there was a lot of rent seeking and corrupt, uh, corruption going on in the officials administering these, uh, these licenses. The other one was that not all these farmers were connected appropriately to the grid. And yet the electricity grid is often there. There's a, a map on the top right showing uh, night lights, showing that how well provided with electricity uh, the vast majority of uh, West Bengal is. What we did uh, was having defined the, the potential to use uh, this shallow groundwater to intensify the cropping system, we then again went to government. And the very top of government, so the, the, the senior ministers, uh, in, the, in the West Bengal government and pointed out that what could be done. And it was very quickly agreed that uh, the fee for connection to the electricity grid was going to be reduced markedly down to a one-off, I think it's about 10,000 rupee fee, which is affordable for many farmers. And the licence fee for groundwater extraction for small extractors in those blocks which are not affected by arsenic has been totally removed. We sort of rubbed our hands with glee and thought this was a great success. However, this message sort of wasn't carried through from the top of government to the officials, and so not a lot happened. We went back to government, and now they realise this, and there's a major publicity campaign in all the media, in all the villages and on the, uh, in West Bengal, pointing out uh, these changes are in effect, and people can take advantage of them. Uh, and so we expect uh, to see very significant numbers of farmers uh, beneficially impacted by being able to sort of double up production and improve their li livelihoods in these areas. So what are, what are the lessons that we, we take home from this? And the first one to me is always that good policy, which is vital to water management, has to be based on sound scientific evidence. Uh, we, we could move down different tracks in all these cases and we could see unsustainable sort of development occurring. The other side of things is, of course, if we pushed in West Bengal to sort of produce water from areas with significant arsenic, there would be major externalities. We would, we would cause additional problems that there already exist with problems with drinking water there. We would cause problems in Tanzania uh, and so on. So we have to look at... Uh, all the potential externalities, both in terms of human health and environmental health, coming back to the ecosystem services issues, to make sure that agri agricultural intensification is going to be sustainable. Often, as from the West Bengal case, we have to make sure that we uh, put in place the appropriate ways in which institutions and outdated governance systems can be reformed to unlock potential. And that should never be underestimated. Uh, uh, dealing with the human and social side in these areas is often much harder than coming up with appropriate uh, scientific solutions. And lastly, uh, we have to make sure that we uh, empower, empower many of the poor farmers uh, 
so that not only can they get access to electricity, they can get access to microfinance, uh, but they can get ex access to expertise to build their own capacity. These are all, all vital issues. So it's got, we've got to look at this from the whole supply chain and the whole management chain and governance chain. So my conclusion is that we can significantly impact and improve food production to get to this 60 or 70 percent more that is required to feed the 9 billion. But we've got to really look at how we can revitalise agricultural water use and make sure that we get the policy levers right and particularly make sure that uh, we avoid some of the potential pitfalls and negative externalities. So, Your Majesty, with that, I would like to sort of conclude my talk saying that there are ways we can proceed, but we have to do it very carefully. Thank you.